Hey QED coders, Michael L. Perry here. Last time we talked about identity and uniqueness, and so today we want to talk about specifically what makes a good unique key for a fact. And so we're going to be talking about natural keys. So I want you to compare natural keys with surrogate keys. A surrogate key is something that takes the place of identity, but a natural key is something that comes from the domain itself. So take, for example, a database table. If I have an auto-generated primary key, that key is a surrogate key. It takes the place of the identity of this thing that we're storing in the, into the table. But if I take some concept from the domain, say somebody's name or social security number, that becomes a natural key. So we'll talk about what makes a good natural key, what doesn't make a good natural key, and how to select something to make your facts unique. We're going to start by talking about customers. So a customer in this database table has a customer ID. And we already know that we don't want to store the customer name in this table because customer names can change. They're mutable. And we don't want to perform updates on our tables. So we'll move customer name out to a different table. But now, how do I identify a unique customer? I can't identify them by name because names could change. And so the typical thing to do is to use the surrogate key the primary key that's automatically generated when I insert a record into this table. Let's see what problems arise if I use that surrogate key as the identity of a customer. So the first thing that happens is that any time I need to generate a new customer ID, I have to go all the way back to the database, perform the insert, and then I'll get back the ID that was just inserted. Doing so means that I can't work in a disconnected fashion. I can't store and forward my requests. And it also makes it very difficult for me to synchronize two different databases because those automatically generated IDs are going to be automatically generated in sequence in parallel. And so you're going to get collisions. And those IDs are going to mean different customers on different databases. So in order to support distributed systems where we can work in a disconnected fashion and we can work against different repositories and merge later, I don't want to use this automatically generated ID as the identity of a customer. And so I need to come up with some other identity. I'm going to come up with a different surrogate key that I generate externally. So in this case, I'll use a GUID. And now when I have a client that needs to record a brand new customer, that client can generate the GUID. It doesn't have to go all the way to the server in order to get the ID. So the client can generate that customer GUID, package that up with some subsequent records. So here's the customer name relative to that good. Here is an invoice for that customer relative to that good, all without knowing what the generated internal surrogate key is going to be. So that's an advantage, and that's the way that we'll model the customer table. By the way, there's a different way that we could model this. Instead of using a good, we could use a timestamp. If we know that generating customers is something that's done very infrequently or within some bounded scope, then we can say that if you generate a timestamp down to the millisecond, perhaps, then it's probably going to be unique enough. But GUID is a safe bet. Now, this GUID is still a surrogate key. It's not the true identity of the customer, but it stands in for the identity. It's just simply generated from the outside, not generated by the database itself. But if I were to take a look at invoices, there I can find a true natural key. So here's our invoice table. It's going to have an invoice ID. And we'll have a natural key, the invoice number. This invoice number is going to be generated by some business process, not by an insert into the database. And this business process will generate a unique invoice number every time. So maybe we generate a bunch of invoice numbers ahead of time and send those out to clients. And then the clients can choose a unique invoice number whenever they would want to issue an invoice. Whatever the business process is, that business process doesn't rely upon going all the way back to the server to perform an insert before it can get back a unique invoice number. And so that invoice number, now being part of the problem domain, is a natural key. So I'm going to add the invoice number as a column to the invoice table, and I'll mark that as a unique column. So I know that I can't insert an additional invoice with the same invoice number. Now, an invoice belongs to a customer. So you might think, OK, let's go ahead and add the customer ID to this table as well as a foreign key. 
But now notice what you've just done. This table now has two columns that are not its primary key that when you take the identity of the fact, that's going to be the combination of all of its properties. So the identity of this fact would actually be the invoice number and the customer ID, the customer's identity. If I use that as the identity of the fact, then that means that it's possible within the historical model to create two different invoices for two different customers that have the same invoice number. Now, I know my business process doesn't allow that to happen, but we're not modeling the actual business process in the database. We're modeling something more strict. So if the database model allows it, then that means that it could possibly happen. Now, this database model, since we have a uniqueness constraint on the invoice number, is not going to allow that second insert. But what if I've got the database spread across two different nodes? Maybe I've got two different data centers that I'm syncing up every once in a while. Or maybe I've got an offline cache on my client that I'm capturing new invoices to sync up with the main database later. In either case, if I generate the same invoice number for two different customers, then I won't be able to merge those two databases together. So what I've got here is a fact that has two properties that define its uniqueness. Instead, what I want to do is let this fact be identified only by that unique invoice number. And we'll take the customer ID and we'll move it out to a subsequent table. So I've got a successor that is the customer ID for a particular invoice. Now that model allows something interesting. It allows us to generate the same invoice number for two different customers. So like I said, the business process is going to disallow that. So as long as the business process is working properly, that situation will never happen. But the database reveals to us that it is a scenario that we're going to have to plan for. So if the business process fails, I'll see two customer records for the same invoice. The database can capture it. I can synchronize two different databases, and I can discover that that has happened. And then I'll have all the information I need to resolve that conflict. But we allow that to happen because we can only have things that are unique to the fact as properties of that record. And so all this gives us a couple of examples of what we can use for unique IDs within a historical model. First of all, never use the auto-generated ID externally to represent the identity of a fact. That would require that you have to wait for a connection to the server in order to generate that ID before you can continue. Second, if you can use a natural key, something that's part of the domain, then do so. But if you can't, then you can use a GUID or a timestamp within some bounded context in order to generate a unique ID from the client before you even get to the server. Give that natural key or external surrogate key a uniqueness constraint within your database, and then never add additional properties with that surrogate key or that natural key in the same table, even if those properties are immutable. Because doing so compromises the identity of the fact itself and means that you could possibly have multiple facts with different properties, but the same unique ID. I mean, uniqueness constraints are great and all, but they can't be enforced within a distributed system across disparate nodes. So next time, I want to dive into that a little bit more. I want to talk about how we can have unique identities across disparate nodes within a distributed system. And for that, we're going to dive into location independence. So come on back. Yeah.